tight road, no pun intended, but you really do uh, provide a great service. So I just wanted to publicly thank you for all you do at IDOT and for the professional manner in which you run that office down there. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. I just try to do what's right. Okay, moving to item six then is the Unified Work Program. Lenny Cantata, are Lenny, are you here? I sure am, how are you? Um, uh, in front of you, you'll see the proposal for FY 2022 um, for the planning liaisons. We have our scope of services as well as the overall proposal. The only change to the scope of services was um, we added a section for contract administrative and general support. The PL program will be taking kind of a shift in how we conduct business in the sense that we'll be recording um, our hours spent on the different core planning activities. So something of a consultant format with regards to that. As far as our overall proposal, um, over the last two months or so, all of the um, councils have submitted budgets. And I'd also like to thank uh, Emily Dauscher and uh, Troy Simpson from Kane County and from McHenry County for assisting me with all this, as well as all the PLs. Uh, this was a little bit new uh, to us as far as a budgeting process. So in years past, even before I started, um, each of the councils was allocated a set amount of base funding and then population distributed funding. This year we've shifted to what we're calling an expense-based budgeting metric. So essentially each of the councils are kind of developing their own budgets on what they need to do to perform the tasks uh, as required in the scope of services. Um, also, there sometime also before I started, so sometime before 2007, there was also some positions that were 50-50 funded as opposed to 80-20. Now we're shifting essentially everything to an 80-20. So overall, our request this year has actually gone down, our total request, but the federal share has gone up by about fifty or $60,000. Um, it's about a 4% total federal increase that the PLs are requesting. At this time, over the next month, because UWP proposals, I believe, are due um, in December, we will be working with um, the various PLs on tweaking our budgets to make sure we come in under that. And whatever the UWP committee decides to award us, um, we'll kind of work within that budget. So we're just kind of asking for an overall flexibility and approval of the scope of services in the proposal, Mayor. Very good. Anybody have any questions for Lenny? Well, thank you for your very good, precise report. Okay, moving to seven local government network update. Uh, Patrick. Dan. Mayor Shelke, Mayor Shelke, this is yeah. Terry. We have to have an approval. Okay, all right. I'm sorry. Thank, thank you for calling that to my attention. We need a, a, a request for a motion for approval of the Unified Work Program for 2022. Mr. Chairman, I make that motion. Village of Wadsworth, Ryback. I'll second. second. Darch. Second. Mayor Darch, okay. All right, we have a motion and second for the approval of the Unified Work Program uh, for 2022. Any further discussion? Kirk, call the roll. Okay. I'll call the roll. President Austin. <laughs> President Brady. Mayor Clar, President Darch. Yes. President DeCipio. President Einhorn. President Gallagher. Hold yes. on, Mayor Einhorn. Did you say yes? Okay, Jared. We'll get him. Go ahead. President Gallagher. Yes. President Hayes. Yes. Mayor Holland. Yes. President Levin. President Mack. President Nunemaker. Yes. Mayor Rockingham. Aye. President Ryback. Yes. Mayor Shelke. Yes. Mayor Sherwin. Yes. President Skillman. President Spandy. Yes. Mayor Tamburino. Mayor Van Dusen. President Werner, Mayor Williams. Mayor Einhorn votes yes too. Thank you. Yeah, from what my count is, the motion's approved. It is, thank you. All right. 
Now moving to seven, uh, the local government network update, Patrick Day. Hello, thank you, Mayor. I'm Patrick Day and I'm happy to share uh, an update for you today on the newly established local government network or LGN, if you're an acronym person. Most or all of you are aware of this initiative and are active participants, but for those less familiar, this may CMAP launched an all agency effort called the Local Government Network to strengthen our ongoing communications with local leaders. Consistent with ONTO 2050 goals to promote collaboration with local governments and better understand local priorities, we paired CMAP staff with each of the 284 municipalities in the region and seven counties. Parent pairings of staff with municipalities and counties were made based on staff preference and familiarity. For instance, some staff are now serving as liaisons to their hometowns. Others work with the municipality on a project or plan or have long-standing relationships already. And that's just continuing. The local government network allows CMAP and local governments to have direct lines of communication, which we know uh, removes hurdles to communication and is generally just a best practice. So we're formalizing that that has worked um, well in the past, but to have greater coverage. And it allows us to share important resources um, for emergent issues, uh, priority materials, and to uh, enhance collaboration region-wide. Long-term, the goal of the network is to develop an awareness of local culture and to maintain professional relationships that allow easy two-way communication for regional benefit. So, on to the update. So far, we've completed four initiatives since May when this initiative was launched, the program was launched. First was the participation in the regional COVID-19 impact survey. Many of you and your staff filled that out. We achieved uh, a, a even better than expected um, response rate given a very tight timeline, but given the emergent need and everybody's understanding and that personal reach out, it went very well for the region. Next, we shared the updated community data snapshots, very useful as you're putting together grants or you're doing other strategy and local planning. And uh, as we uh, generated that, we gave it in a personal handoff to communities and saw uh, more eyes on it than typically were. Uh, third, we shared the census undercount policy brief that was created and a social media toolkit to help get that word out. And that also went very well. And finally, and it's currently underway, our fourth initiative is a personal invitation to invite municipal officials and staff to this Thursday's CMAP Talks Shared Services online discussion. It will be held from 10 to 11 a.m. Uh, space is limited, so I encourage you to um, uh, access registration and to reserve a space if you plan on attending or directing staff to do so. And best practices communities can use to share services and make coordinated investments. Christina Burns, Assistant Village Administrator for Us We Go, will be a featured speaker, as well as Jenny Maltus, a Deputy Village Administ Manager for Buffalo Grove. And they'll discuss their experiences in collaborating to save public dollars and improve efficiency of local services, as well as share um, uh, in a discussion with, uh, with the attendees on other success stories and lessons learned. This is Consistent with ONTO 2050 is partnerships to share or exchange services are made increasingly um, uh, necessary as communities seek solutions under increasingly constrained revenues. And we hope that you can join us for this uh, important discussion. And if you have any questions uh, on any of our four initiatives, I'm ready to answer them now, or you can follow up with me. Thank you. Any questions of Patrick? Thank you, Patrick. This, I think this is a worthy, wild program that is beginning to take foot in the region, and the information that you're putting together is, I think, going to be invaluable to a number of cities when you start to learn how others have tried to do it and success or had issues or whatever. It's great information to share, so thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, moving then to Item number eight is the principles and strategies for incentive reform, and that's gonna be done by Matt Stern. And I would just invite all of us to really pay attention to what's being said here, because uh, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, tax incentive reform in Illinois, and uh, needless to say that uh, 
that could be quite an interesting topic to most of us that have uh, tax increment financing districts and other forms of uh, ways to try to raise uh, revenue. So, uh, Pat or Matt, I'll turn this over to you and uh, let you go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Schalke. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Matthew Stern. I'm a policy analyst here at CMAP. Um, and for the last year, CMAP has been uh, diving back into our, our study of uh, incentives used by local governments here in the region, most recently to develop a, a handbook for uh, taxing districts across the region to improve the use of development incentives. Um, and, and Mayor Schelke is, is, is dead on. This is a is a hard and complex topic with um, uh, a lot uh, a lot going on and and a lot at stake. And so I, I appreciate you guys taking the time to um, to uh, hear this presentation and, and look forward to the discussion afterwards. Um, so like I said, we've been working on on producing um, a guide for local governments. Uh, we just published it last month, and so I'll, my plan today is to summarize some of. Uh, our lessons learned and some of the recommendations that we make um, and and then hear your responses. Uh, next slide please. CMAP has written about incentive use in the region for many years. Um, this is uh, an issue that that is important to us because incentive use is is widespread across the CMAP region. Uh, and, and that incentive use comes at a, at a substantial fiscal cost. Uh, this is despite research that, that indicates that incentives are, are often inefficient or, or, to be frank, just plain ineffective at achieving uh, the goals that, that they often are, are implemented to achieve. Stepping back for a minute, uh, when CMAP looks at incentives, we primarily look at four common types, um, the, the four most common types in the region. Uh, these are sales tax rebates, tax increment financing, property tax abatements, and then Cook County property assessment incentive classification. Um, if you look at these four types of incentives, over three quarters of municipalities in the seven counties uh, implement at least one of these incentive programs. Uh, you see some, uh, some dollar figures in, in the top right corner, uh, uh, continuing to study and update our analysis of uh, the prevalence of incentive use across the region is something that we're embarking on now and we hope to uh, produce more materials on that in early 2021. Um, but altogether, we know that incentives cost uh, local governments hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and so evaluating their efficacy and identifying ways uh, to improve them, uh, we believe is, is very critical. Next slide. So um, because of this, ONTO 2050 calls for incentive reform, including stronger standards for accountability and transparency, better alignment of incentives with local and regional goals. Um, the plan asks local governments to establish criteria and policies for incentive use, but ONTO 2050 also tasks CMAP to help local governments do this by providing best practices and models. And that's exactly what we're we are trying to do with uh, in this in this product that we just uh, just published last month. So before I summarize um, some of the particular recommendations, I'd like to make two larger sort of contextual points about incentive use. The first is that as we develop this research, uh, we identified what we believe is is really a, a central tension to incentives. On one hand, there's a, a universe of academic researchers who are for the most part agreed that incentives are at best inefficient tools for community and economic development. And incentives have concerning long-term consequences at the local and regional level. Um, for example, uh, research suggests that most incentives don't actually sway business location or expansion decisions. Uh, even in situations where they do, uh, competition based on incentives can lead to bidding wars that drive tax revenues down for local governments over time. And, and fighting over where in the region new development will locate often does very little for our overall competitiveness as a region. However, from the position of the individual taxing district, incentives are often incredibly rational. 
communities face stiff competition from neighbors, be it neighboring taxing districts or neighboring states. Um, and revenue disbursement formulas often reward this competition, especially over sales tax generating business. And then particularly in, in our region's disinvested communities, slow growth, high tax burdens, and limited staff capacity can often make incentives one of the only tools in the toolkit. Um, and so that, uh, uh, that juxtaposition that is, is one of the central challenges that, that we grappled with in this study. Next slide. The second larger point that I want to make um, has to do with, um, sorry, excuse me, has to do with incentives and um, the complicated relationship between incentives and inclusive growth and racial and economic equity. Uh, the events of the last six months, including protests over police killings of black men and women, as well as the disparate impacts of COVID-19, are important reminders of the systemic inequality that we are all hopefully working to dismantle. And this includes in our community and economic development work. Um, in some situations, incentives can uh, be a part of this process. They can promote equity. They can artificially level tax rates across jurisdictions. They can decrease perceived or actual development risks in certain areas. Um, and by, by in these ways, they can promote investment in disinvested areas. Uh, incentive negotiations can also be used to set expectations or requirements of businesses about who they hire and how much they pay, how much training they provide, et cetera. Uh, there's another side of this coin, though, uh, which is that incentives also have real costs and opportunity costs that can end up uh, having the opposite effect. Uh, incentives uh, reduce tax revenues that would otherwise be available to fund robust public services. Uh, marginalized communities may not be the ones who actually benefit from new development. And of course, it's always important to consider uh, negative externalities of incentivized development, such as who is impacted most by increased levels of pollution or truck traffic, things like this. Um, and so incentive policies and, and any given incentive negotiation process need to be approached very intentionally if, uh, if racial and economic equity uh, are, are some of the goals that are um, that are a part of that process. Next slide. So it was, um, sorry, um, yeah, that, perfect, thank you. Uh, it was with these sorts of complexities in mind um, that we set out to write this guide and the format that we settled on was a, um, a, a guide or a handbook, uh, something that we hope will serve as a ready resource for communities and economic, or, for community and economic development professionals uh, who work for taxing districts and work with taxing districts around the region. Um, next slide. The um, guide starts by touching on a working definition for incentives, as well as some basic data about their prevalence in the region. Uh, we summarize some of the clearest pitfalls to incentive use, some of which I've already um, talked about uh, in, in this presentation. And then we really spend the bulk of the guide laying out overarching principles and then 10 recommended evidence-based strategies for making sure that incentives are doing the most good possible. Each strategy contains specific implementable practices. There are uh, 60 of them in all in the guide that we encourage taxing districts in the region to consider adopting. So those four key principles um, that we include are that all incentives or incentive use in general should always be performance driven. Um, it, it, they should be used when they're the most effective tool in the toolkit and improved over time. Uh, incentive use should be transparent. Uh, communities should have a, a good sense of how their local governments are, are utilizing incentives and to what end. Incentive use uh, should pursue equity. And then incentive use should, uh, where possible, pursue regional growth and regional benefit. Um, in addition to those at the local level. What happened to that slide? I'm sorry about that. Um, so we include 10 strategies in the guide. I uh, can't expect uh, any, any of you to, to read this, but, but a handful of them um, are using incentives to develop community benefits and advance equity, targeting projects that have the greatest potential for impact, designing incentives to promote high quality employment, 
um, and considering non-financial solutions to challenges that prospective businesses may face. Um, those are a, a small sample of, of the 10 that the guide includes. And the next two slides uh, go into detail into just two of these uh, overall strategies so that you get a sense of what sorts of practices we include. Um, one of the strategies, design incentives to promote high quality employment, includes uh, practices like uh, first source hiring expectations and facilitating connections with job training programs, as well as best practices. These are things that are more contextual and, and may apply in, in some situations for some local governments, uh, but not necessarily universally. Uh, things like funding, tailored job training programs, mandating career pathway programs, um, and of course, better support for uh, uh, accommodations for workers with disabilities um, and, and things like this. Next slide. The other goal that I'll go into a little bit of detail on today is uh, the notion of establishing uh, goals and conditions for incentive use in a public and formal way, such as through an incentive policy. Um, the practices that we recommend here involve uh, building consensus about linkages between what a community's development goals are and how that community actually utilizes incentives. Uh, aligning incentive use with local plans and regional plans um, and making processes more transparent. Uh, the benefits of this transparency um, uh, include the community's understanding of, of governance choices, but also help businesses better understand the processes that are expected of them uh, and can help them navigate uh, an incentive application. Um, and our best practice here is to, is to take these standard practices and uh, put them together in a formal incentive policy that, that is uh, published and transparent. Next slide, please. So I'll, I'll wrap up there. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I encourage you to um, download the guide. I'll drop this link into the chat um, as soon as I'm done presenting. Um, so take a look at it, share any feedback you might have with us. Also share this with your councils, with your staff. Um, and I also want to make an offer, which is for, for the team that has worked on this project, we would be more than happy to, to talk to you, talk to your councils um, more about this work uh, and help uh, talk about how recommendations in this guide can actually be implemented at the local level. Um, so I will uh, I'll stop there and, and happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. That was an excellent report. Uh, talk about something that's very topical for many of us on this call as far as it's in our faces right now about uh, TIF districts and sales tax rebates and all the other stuff that's floating around out there. So this is great to know that we have a resource like you at CMAP that can help give us some guidance on this. Did anybody on the call have any questions? I do. Go ahead. Uh, this is probably not going to be a very... Uh, um, I don't know what to, how, to, how to preface this, but um, how many people that uh, were working on this have ever done a deal? Um, if the the staff working on the report, we we are a group of policy analysts. Uh, unsurprisingly, um, we none of us have worked uh, uh, in this space directly, uh, but our uh, we spent a number of months interviewing practitioners um, on. The local government side as well as the private sector side uh, to inform these conversations. I just I just uh, worry about the uh, theory overshadowing the practical end of things because I've done a lot of deals and no two are alike and it's just um, everything is different and I'm guessing if it's everything is different in Crete it's probably everything is different in other communities too. And um, I don't know that I subscribe to all your conclusions. So um, one of the things that really kind of worries me is that recently there was about a 25 page document that was put out by the state legislature that studied TIFs. And it was very obvious if you read it that the people that wrote the document had no idea how to use a TIF, what a TIF was about, and the suggestions that they were making about uh, how TIF should be changed uh, are are not based in fact, quite frankly. That's my that's my personal opinion. So, Mayor, I I appreciate that comment. Um, we 
one of the challenges in putting this document together was an appreciation that uh, not only is every community different um, in their approach and their needs to, to these issues, but that frankly, as you mentioned, every every single deal is different and the context of every deal is different. And so producing um, implementable uh, recommendations or, or strategies uh, that apply across the region, across different categories of deals, across different deal structures, uh, was was uh, a challenge, and, and I, I hope that we uh, lived up to that challenge um, uh, at least to some extent. Um, and I would certainly invite um, uh, specific feedback that you have about the conclusions that that we draw um, here in this forum or or privately. We, we'd be happy to to discuss uh, them more. Uh, we we certainly. Uh, believe that uh, the recommendations in the guide are broadly applicable, but understand that every single one may not be applicable in every single situation. Uh, and we do focus, uh, you know, the, the majority of the guide is is focused um, on on strategies as opposed to um, as opposed to on that context and theory. Uh, but I yes, plan, I, I, I think read this. So like, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I, I say I plan I plan on downloading this and reading it. Uh, because I'm interested to see what, you know, what's in it. Um, but um, I just think the, any kind of any kind of suggestions have to be tempered with reality. I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and our and our goal here was to uh, try to bridge the the uh, communication divide between uh, uh, practitioners like yourself um, and the world of academic study on this issue. Um, and, and I'll be curious uh, to know once you've had a chance to take a look whether you think we succeeded in doing that. Any other questions? I would certainly pick up on what Mayor Einhorn has just uh, suggested, and some of us should uh, download this and read this in totality because I think they're just on this call, knowing most of you and what towns you're from, uh, there is a vi wide variance of situations that these cities and villages have to do deal with. And I believe the number in the Chicago and area that we're covering is like 284 cities and villages in the in the in the CMAP region. And as a result of that, there's there's uh, having I have visited each and every one of them at some point in the last 30, 40 years. And there is a wide variance of situations occurring throughout those those communities. So uh, none of us are the same, and there is great variance on things that we have and don't have. And uh, I think it speaks well to have some some professional academic study done on this, if nothing else, to kind of bring that point out and let the region know that uh, you know some of us may need more direction or help than others, and others may have some great ideas that nobody has ever thought of yet that that should be shared. And so I think the more history we can write on this and the, the production of it out into the region is nothing but beneficial to everybody involved. And uh, hopefully even future generations may want to look at this and see what's going on. It's like the COVID crisis right now. I'm led to believe that there's some efforts being made to write some histories about what really happened here on kind of a moment by moment basis so that, you know, if it, this happens again in a hundred years or whatever, be, people will be able to go back and see what was the pitfalls and what was the successes. And I, you know, I think there's some need to point out who failed and who really stepped up and was successful. And sometimes it's a bitter pill for government to buy into that and accept it, but those stories need to be told. And certainly in, in this subject and certainly in the COVID, there is a definite need to have some, some broad research done about what it is that worked and what didn't work uh, because I think all of us who are mayors have all been kind of beat to the bow on what people like and don't like and all the things that are going on and how it was done and where was the Illinois General Assembly through all this. There's a lot of questions about all this stuff that really needs to be at least uh, publicly recorded so that there's records of it out there. And I think Matthew and your team are really going to put together some stuff that will be of great value to not only today but tomorrow and those coming after us. So thank you. All right. Uh, next, we're going to go to 10, which is the legislative discussion update. And Gordon Smith could be with us today. So Anthony Savalli is going to do it. Anthony, are you with us? And Mayor Shulky, you skipped um, not number nine. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Hold on, Anthony. We're going to go to CMAP Outreach or, and Engagement Updates by Lindsay Bailey. Thank you, Mayor Schilke. I will be brief. Um, I just wanted to talk to everybody about our process for engagement during the coronavirus pandemic. So if you can go to the next slide, Jared. Many of us, especially as the the spring started to look a little nicer, we're very eager to get out into the community. And when it comes to doing our local technical assistance projects, we know how important, and I'm sure you know, recognize how important it is to have that interaction with community members and see people face to face. But in the middle of a pandemic, as planning is important, it, our presence in communities is not essential as much as we would like to think otherwise. So we are really making sure that health and safety is our top priority. So this means both the health of our, our employees, but also the health of the people that we are interacting with. We would not want to hold some public event and bring coronavirus to a community. Um, and even beyond that, some of the considerations that Aaron and Amy brought to our attention include things like if we held an event and somebody who contracted coronavirus from another method had attended it, that person could say, oh, well, I attended a CMAP event and I got coronavirus. So we really want to avoid any possibility of that. So I'll just go to the next slide and talk about what we are focusing on. So we really are putting an emphasis on the online engagement and looking for ways that we can be a little more creative and innovative. We have a team that is setting up sites through a platform called Engagement HQ. We are holding focus group meetings, stakeholder interviews, and our team meetings online and looking to see as much as we can do through that method and interacting on public forums. We have talked about communities where the in-person engagement is very important, especially if they're, the community does not have much or has low broadband access and the importance of still being able to reach people if we aren't going to put projects on hold. Um, so we asked Amy and Aaron for some direction to how we could proceed and what could be possible. And we have talked about doing some limited engagement through outdoor activities. And these would be very minimal staff, one, maybe two people, and things like a site visit, whether that is walking around the community with a steering committee member um, or doing a parcel inventory and recording what the existing conditions are. Um, we've also talked about the possibility of setting up a table at something that is happening that could be a food delivery program for communities in need. It could be uh, in a community by the post office. Um, we also have talked about the possibility of if there is community service or volunteer opportunities, how we might be able to help do some work that is safe with masks where we are not leaving it. Um, so thank you for going to the next one. We want to establish some guidelines for each of these activities. Uh, we want to make it clear that no staff would be required to participate in any in-person event. That would be something that they would make a decision for themselves. Um, we are creating a process where we would request uh, permission to conduct an activity and outline what that would be, uh, what type of engagement it is, what the goals of the activity are and why we need to, can't do it online, and then number of staff and what our safety protocols would be. Um, so the need for any in-person engagement would be weighed for any potential risks and each activity would be assessed. Um, and we also wanna make sure we have a clear process so that the community understands. We wanna make sure that you know, we can follow the lead of RTA, the Regional Transportation Authority, who has done a very thorough job of documenting who is working at every point in an activity, whether it's the person who is bagging up the materials to be handed out at the table. Um, all staff would be required to wear face masks and have hand sanitizer. There would be signs requesting mask compliance and not reusing materials. Uh, we also would not have staff 
in the situation where they might have to police anyone who is not wearing a mask, so they would be perfectly free to remove themselves from any situation that they did not feel comfortable in. So those are the general outlines and I'm sure Amy can also help to answer any questions if there are any. So we just wanted to update you all on how we are continuing to engage communities while we are mostly at home. Any questions of Lindsay? Thank you for a very nice report. Appreciate your work. It's going to be very valuable in the future. Uh, then moving to 10, which is legislative discussion. Anthony Savalli. Anthony? Thank you, Mayor. I'm just here to answer any questions that anybody may have about the General Assembly going into veto and next session. Anybody got any questions? I guess I've got one. Uh, Where's the General Assembly been through the whole COVID thing? Why didn't they uh, meet and renew the, the governor's uh, executive orders? That's really left myself, I'll only speak for myself, in a real mess out here in Batavia because I got people screaming at me that uh, we don't have any authority to be closing businesses or making them wear masks. And uh, then the other people say, well, the state legislature won't meet because they ran and hid and whatever. What's, what's the word in Springfield about why we don't want to meet about this? It's difficult to say at this time, Mayor, um, but we, we can talk about that further offline. <laughs> okay, I, I didn't mean to put well, I think we should talk about it now. No, I think the mayor certainly can feel free to fire off if you want to here. I already did, so let me know. My, I've, uh, I publicly have made statements that I think the Illinois General Assembly has left us cold out in the wind and uh, has taken cover and doesn't want to talk about it, doesn't want to get near it, doesn't want it brought up in their elections. And uh, I don't even think they wanted to go to Springfield and meet each other for fear one of them would bring COVID down there and give it to each other. So that's my two cents. But uh, I think it's a, it's a sad moment in the history of the Illinois General Assembly. And I hope it's something that when we write the history about this, their actions are recorded as a, when the government abandoned itself. You got me on my soapbox. Anybody else want to shoot off here? Yeah, this is Eric over uh, for DuPage County. I'd like to second that. Uh, there's an awful lot of restaurants in this area that are basically showing open and contemptuous defiance of the governor. Mayors such as myself are left utterly powerless because we know, or at least I hope we know, we really don't have any authority to, especially as non-home road communities, to enforce uh, health-related items because of how this was rolled out. And then, of course, I'm getting all sorts of pings from residents who are outraged that this restaurant isn't closing. Other restaurants are uh, suggesting that uh, it's not fair, that they're opening, but we're not. And it puts us, it puts mayors in an untenable situation where we're under the gun, you don't have any tools to get the job done. And I have to tell you, I'm not sure that I want to be the bad guy and put the village in legal jeopardy to uh, enforce the governor's order. So I completely agree that the legislature should, if they really think the COVID-19 restrictions are thoughtful and useful and protectable public health, they need to step up and provide some additional guidance, at least stand with the governor or offer additional thoughts on how this could be uh, revised. So uh, I'll get off my soapbox, thanks. I just Thank don't you. understand why in the world uh, the state cannot offer up some data that shows that places like the other mayor just mentioned, restaurants and things of that nature, are actually the source of the problem. Um, you know, they got all kinds of other, you know, data and stuff that they talk about, and they tell you that they're doing uh, contact tracing and all kind of things like that, but I have not heard anybody say that they can relate this back to an eating establishment. Uh, uh, this, this is Eric Sweeney again. I can, I can actually address that. I contacted one of my uh, DuPage County uh, District 6 representatives and I asked that exact question. Where are the uh, percentages or can they do some contact tracing that would demonstrate that restaurants and bars are a hotspot or are generating uh, concerns. I know that the, pres that the uh, president of the DMMC here in DuPage County has already fired off a letter to the governor uh, challenging 
some of the uh, why restaurants have been targeted when, according to the data that he has found, they're, they're uh, likely sourced from like one or maybe two percent of the COVID cases. And so Sheila Rutledge from my District 6 representative of DuPage looked at the DuPage County and Public Health and was able to get to me today a summary that did some contact tracing and reports and what it was uh, entitled Outbreaks by Setting. And restaurants are indeed maybe a couple of percent of the total number of uh, incidents for COVID, according to that data set, which I think is current through mid or maybe the later part of October. And so then there are many other uh, types of uh, activities, manufacturing, warehouse, churches that are much, much higher than restaurants. And so what Frank Trilla, the president of the DMMC, asked the obvious question, why are you targeting restaurants when by comparison, they are a fairly small percentage of COVID cases? And if you really are trying to be effective, why are the items, why are the activities, the businesses, and other locations that are potentially real hot spots being overlooked? Um, so there's some opportunity for, crit for thoughtful and criticism and also some further discussion. Thanks. Hi, right, this is Scott Sherwin. Um, the only, you know, COVID aside, the other benefit that we do have of them not meeting is they're not causing us mischief in other areas. So <laughs> it, it, it's a blessing and a, and a curse, but I'm glad they're not able to hamstring us with a lot of other stuff like they usually do. It just seems to me like it's, uh, they put a cast on in your arm because your foot's broke. All right, we're firing off now. Who, who else wants to make some comments? Mayor, this is Alice Gallagher. I do agree with everything everyone has said, but I was wondering if the mayor could uh, share that data that he got uh, or the DuPage mayors and managers received. Is it possible to share that with the rest of us? Oh, sure. I'll, this is Eric Spandy from uh, DuPage County. I'll be happy to share that. Uh, the information is from Dennis Brennan of the DuPage County Health Department, and it was solicited by my District 6 representative, Sheila Rutledge. I guess the question then is, to whom at CMAP Council of Mayors should I send this so it can be appropriately distributed? So I'm, I'm more than happy to share this information, which I thought was instructive. Mayor Spandy, this is Terry Dixon. You can send it to me or um, Jared or to Kama. Any of any of us can take it. But could you do me a favor and give me your email address, and I'll go ahead. Sure, and I'll shoot it. I'll send it to you. you right away. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I'll send it to you. I will send it to you. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you. I'll get this off to you immediately before I start wandering off on other important business. So thanks. Thank you. Anybody else want to make a statement about this whole situation? I know it's on the minds of all of us. I, I'll just share one tidbit of gossip, I'll call it, that is there. I was contacted the other day by a local, there's these young men and women that run around the area and they make videos. And they, if they can get to the latest fire or accident or high news thing and they can get the video, then I guess there's a market where they can sell this videotape to uh, the TV news people. And then there's others that want to make tapes for politicians. Maybe something's going on and they can sell it to somebody that's running for state representative or Congress or whatever have you and show some good or bad thing that's going on. So they're always looking. So interestingly, I get this call the other day from this guy and he says to me, uh, Jeff, do you know uh, where all the uh, local politicians are having their victory parties a uh, week from today? Uh, are they renting uh, restaurants or lodge halls or where, you know where anybody's going to be? And I said, well, I really don't. I haven't heard of any. He says, well, he says, you know, you think about this. Uh, the governor came out with this new order that's for two weeks, and that includes election night. So how are any of these politicians going to have a party in which they're gonna be able to have all their fans and friends there uh, up close and personal and breathing in each other's face while the, while the winner or the loser gives their concession or their victory speech. And I said, well, it's a good question. He says, yeah, I, there's, I, there's probably a good market for some people to make some video of that. That could be worth a lot of money in future elections in some instances when you say, do as I say, but not as I do. 
And so we'll see where this all goes, but I know there are people out waiting to see where the victory parties are gonna be next Tuesday night and are gonna to wanna to be in there taking pictures of it. So we'll see where that goes. That's gonna put a, a pretty uncomfortable situation in the face of specifically, I think the governor's office, that if all these came come out and they're showing all these people having these parties on a time when there's not supposed to be anybody in any restaurants or meeting halls or whatever have you, it will be an interesting commentary for somebody to talk about. So I'll just throw that out there for the benefit of the rest of you because I was the one that got the call about it. All right, uh, I guess we go to 11, do we have other business? People kind of other businesses seem pretty good today, but do we have any other business? All right, do we have any public comment? Does the staff, uh, Anybody send us any emails or requests to chat or anything? We have anything, lady? No, Mayor Shulky, I I don't see any. Does anybody else who's been um, monitoring see anything? Nothing. Yeah, we're going to get done just in time to catch the train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good way. Put it. Okay, if, if there are no other public comments, the next Council of Mayors Executive Committee will be in January. The scheduling for all CMAP committee meetings is in process. Uh, upon completion, staff will send the committee schedule for next year's meetings out to us all. And we are anticipating notification uh, in November for this. So if there is no other business before the committee, I am adjourning the meeting and I look forward to seeing you all in January. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Shulky. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, Thank you. everyone. Stay safe. Yep, stay safe. Happy holidays. <laughs>